strong. Uh, good to be here today and thrilling to be uh, connecting with uh, so many people here about our work. I'm really looking forward to the symposium that follows as a dialogue between the work we, Sangeeta and I, have been doing at USC together and uh, the kinds of conversations that are taking a place here on some of the same, same issues. So the talk that I'm going to deliver, let me get my stuff pulled up here. The talk I'm going to deliver really builds on two projects where, there it is, I see, symposium. Two projects I've been involved with. The first of them is, as was mentioned, my next forthcoming book. It's called Spreadable Media Creating Meaning and Value in a Network Society, which I co-authored with Joshua Green and Sam Ford. And it's coming out in the English language edition will come out in January of next year. And we hope to rapidly get it translated into other languages around, around Europe. But um, it will certainly be sparking a discussion. I should say around this particular project, we're going to have about 40 essays by other scholars and industry leaders. Then we'll start rolling out on the web as of November, we think. Uh, so there's altogether about 75,000 words of material that's tied to the book that will circulate free around the book. And that's in part consistent with the theories of the book. The other thing this draws on is the work that the Civic Task team has been used doing at the University of Southern California. This is work funded by the MacArthur and Spencer Foundation, and that's resulted in a special issue of the journal of Transformative Works and Cultures that Sangeeta and I co-edited that just went online last week. So if you want to follow up on some of the ideas, there's a lot of material there that we'll speak to in. So I will, I will begin. Uh, I'm going to begin with CUNY 2012. And how many people here know about CUNY 2012? Almost everyone in this room. Very, very interesting. As I've traveled around Europe, so I, the younger the audience is, the much, they're much more likely to know what I'm talking about when I write one. So I had an incredible split in Madrid, uh, where I asked an audience, partially high school students, partially adult faculty. And every high school student shot at the hands instantly, and only two or three of the adult faculty had any clue what CUNY 2012 was. Uh, and this tells us something about the difference between, say, broadcast media and grassroots media. Because if I ask who in the room knows Dark Shadows or The Avengers or Prometheus, pretty much every, everyone in the room will know it because Hollywood pushes out its products. So that there's hyper awareness everywhere in the room. You may not have seen it, but you know what it is. Where something like Cooney 2012, which is a half hour human rights documentary. Um, concerned with Ugandan child soldiers, uh, which was released by a grassroots or a, a nonprofit organization called Invisible Children, which is based in Southern California. You either know it, you know it and you've seen it, or you are aware of it in a very deep way, or you don't know it exists at all. But, so I'm going to begin with the story of CUNY 2012, uh, which begins with a very impassioned representation of the power of social media to change the world. And that's, I think, what grabs your attention first when you watch this video, is just the sense in which it's telling you, telling young people in particular, they can make a difference, that there's a way that they have power under the current structure they didn't have before. It ends with a, a message above all past this law. So it advocates a very specific action to spread this video in a way. Oops. Sure, and it spread this video in a way that will enable uh, more people to see it. Now what's interesting is they, the people in Invisible Children estimated roughly a half a million people would see the video by the end of May. That was their initial estimate. Uh, instead, something really amazing happens. So what we see here is a chart showing the so-called viral videos in, uh, from mostly American content and how fast they spread. And so what you see at one end, the sneezing panda took 901 <laughs> days to reach 70 million views. Uh, we, Charlie bit my finger, 402 days. David after the dentist, 262. Old Spice campaign, 158. Susan Boyle video, seven. And CUNY 2012 took four days to reach 70 million viewers. Just to put that into perspective, uh, the highest rated show on American television gets about 40 million viewers a week. 
the Hunger Games, which opened that weekend in theaters to the biggest box office up to that time this year, reached about 14, 15 million viewers, depending on how you break down the numbers that we have about box office return. So you could take the highest rated show on American television and the top grossing movie in Hollywood that week, that year so far, and add them together and still not get to the 70 million viewers that this grassroots circulated video reached in four days time. Now of course, Invisible Children was in no way ready to receive, receive the level of attention it got. Their website wasn't ready. They hadn't put up content they were expecting. They hadn't really prepared the staff for the influx that was coming in. They were unprepared and literally it's crushed them as an organization to have that level of attention and interest directed at them that quickly after they launched the video. But it's an extraordinary success of sort of networked communication, social media as it exists at the present time. Oops, I'm going to skip over that. So part of what they tried to do was to mobilize this power of social media to call out celebrities and public figures who in turn would amplify the impact. So if they got a, a public figure attached to the campaign, their tweets, their social presence would further expand the network that the campaign was going to reach. And uh, I think that's part of the story we want to see. So we now have some snapshots of what happened with this video as it rolled out. And these are some snapshots developed by Social Flow. This is just, I believe, the first four days of the launch of the video. And these are the tw only the tweets that circulated over the first four days. As we might imagine, here at the center, the largest single category is Invisible Children itself. That's the production company, that uh, organization that released the video. Up at the top, we see Jason Russell, the filmmaker, obviously plays a very large role in the circulation of his text. We can see that the campaign to call out celebrities has started to have some impact, because Kirsten Bell of Veronica Mars fame is one of the first celebrities to get behind this, and she's generating a lot of buzz. Well, what interested us was the, the sort of big clusters encircled around here, which represent Dayton, Ohio, Birmingham, Alabama, Noblesville, Indiana, Oklahoma City, and Pittsburgh. So these are middle-sized, middle-of-the-country cities that by and large are not thought of as major cultural influencers in the United States. I mean, this is not Los Angeles and New York, which be the center of the broadcast world in the United States. It's not even Atlanta, which might be a hub for cable television circulation, or Washington, D.C., which is sort of the policy hub in the United States. These are cities in the middle of the country who are exerting the ability to put a topic on the national agenda. Because what happens is this video spreads around, it's getting coverage in the news, it gets coverage in the editorial page, people are discussing it. It's become the topic for that period of time that everyone wanted to focus attention on. So some of that attention is focused negatively on invisible children, and there are legitimate reasons to be critical of the politics of the particular video. But a lot of it was focused on Africa and was part of a dialogue about Africa, the video sparked. So whether we like the video or not, for a period of time, it focused the attention of the United States and chunks of Europe on an issue that we don't normally focus on and we don't normally talk about. And it did it so not by the major media hubs, which is the key point to make about this particular story. Now, as the video starts to circulate, this, the other thing we see, the, these are, this wordle represents the size of the word is how often it cropped up in those tweets. So the bigger they are, the more often they cropped up. And so one of the things that's interesting about Invisible Children as an organization is that it's an organization that is both appealed to churches and to universities, the high schools. But it has to use a slightly different coding in each case, because if it's going to appear in public schools, in the United States, it can't have an overtly religious message. So what we see here, once, it, once we and see the breakdown, we see lots of words here associated with Christianity, at least American forms of Christianity. God and Jesus clearly are Christian terms. Probably the size of life, love, and the world probably also come out of particularly Christian discourses. The world may be the most debatable of those. But then if we look slightly smaller, we see university, student, music, fan, play, sports, which probably represent a student population that's involved in circulating the video. This just gives us a snapshot again of the fact that as these videos travel, they're inserted into a range of different conversations. 
by different groups who use them to talk about different sets of ideas. And it's not that one size fits all, it's not lowest common denominator, it's that as videos are circulated for diverse motives. Now, the, the Invisible Children had built up a base of support and interest over about eight years by creating a range of other videos of recruiting young people to be part of activist groups. Uh, these are some of the videos they produced. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> sort of building up this uh, base. Now, we can be skeptical a little bit about what it means to pass this along, right? Um, and yeah, plenty of people passed this video along who were not deeply committed, who were not hardcore recruits of the, of the Invisible Children organization, who passed it along because their friends passed it to them and became part of the social currency among segments of the population who passed it along because they just wanted to do something and passing it along where it's ended. There were, on the other hand, the, this group had had large public rallies in cities across the country over an extended period of time. There were people who were deeply committed to it. It's what relationship do we posit between these two, two things? So researchers at George Washington University have looked at promotional social activity overall, and they give us a snapshot of what might have happened with invisible children. They said that the people who pass along content are as likely as non-social media past promoters to donate, twice as likely to volunteer their time, twice as likely to take part in events like charity walks, more than twice as likely to buy products or services from companies that support the cause, and three times as likely to solicit donations on behalf of their cause. Now, it's a little bit of hypocrisy if you think about the fact that they're, they're more likely to solicit donations, but no more likely to give donations. But nevertheless, what we see here is a pattern that says that there is a definite increase in engagement and participation when people connect with the activity of passing along content. It's not miraculous. You don't automatically become a foot soldier in the Invisible Children organization just because you passed along this content. But having made that first stake, having made that first commitment to passing along content, you are marginally more likely to take the next step. So if we, after the first video circulating got 70 million or thereabout, the second video circulates, the response to the, pro the critiques of the video, and it gets about two million circulators the last, in, the, in the first week or so of its distribution. Now, that's not fantastic, and you can read it as, oh, you went from 70 to two million. That's an enormous drop down. Or you can look at it from the other side, and they were expecting half a million supporters. They got two million supporters. They got two million people interested enough to return to the next time. If you were an advertising campaign and you got two, you know, that percentage of turnaround, it would be considered highly successful. So there's a lot of debate in the, in the U.S. about did the campaign fail despite its reach? And I think the answer is what's your expectations? Fail by which criteria? It was highly successful, I think, in generating awareness and sparking a conversation and a dialogue and getting people curious to pursue other content. It had some fall off in terms of people seeking future content and fall off more as in terms of people taking to the streets are involved in direct action around the issue. But it definitely had an impact of one sort or another. Um, all right, so how do we describe the young people who are involved in invisible children? And one of the terms that gets used an awful lot to describe that generation, and it probably extends to the generation sitting in this room, was that they're digital natives. That is, they grew up in a world where digital media was normative. And their parents' generation are digital immigrants, that they, they have moved to the digital world since becoming adults. And Mark Perinsky, who turned this stuff, says the adults compute with an accent. That is, they will never be native speakers of the digital world. And that would certainly account for why um, there's a gap between the, the kinds of knowledge I've seen across Europe of young people who know CUNY 2012 and so, many, so few adults who actually know CUNY 2012. There is a generational difference we want to talk about. At the same time, I'm very uncomfortable with the discourse of digital natives, uh, starting with the fact that it's a deeply problematic metaphor, especially in the context of America. To call someone a native uh, comes with a lot of baggage attached to it. So does calling someone an immigrant, right? Both of those are things you want to be cautious about uh, using metaphors of immigration or natives 
at least in our context, and, and certainly the immigrant word is probably very loaded here across Europe as well at this point. So we want to be cautious, what do we mean? And we wouldn't accept all of the connotations of it in, if we were talking about the real world that come with it when we talk about the digital world. A key part of it is it erases differences in experiences, right? That not everyone in this room grew up with the same degree of access to digital technology, and certainly those people who are not in this room, those people who haven't been able to go to college or participate in university activities probably had less opportunities to participate digitally. So it makes it sound like every young person is deeply immersed in the digital, has access to digital technologies, and so forth. And I think that's very dangerous for us to say, because we really are locked in a moment of struggle where the goal ought to be to fight to broaden access to opportunities to meaningfully participate in our culture. And the politics of participation certainly should extend to fighting on those issues. Another problem with that framing is that it ignores the connection between young people and adults. That is here we see the father and son are involved in the same shared fantasy. And indeed, if we look at fan communities or gamer communities, what's striking about them is not that they're entirely run by young people but rather that adults and youth participate side by side in these communities uh, without the sort of hierarchical relationships that structure the relation of adult and youth in schools or churches or families or any traditionally structured organization. That they, are, they have shared interests, that sometimes young people teach adults, sometimes adults teach young people, but the fluidity of it is something that's possible in these online communities that are much harder to achieve seemingly in face-to-face -face communities that we operate within. It this language devalues what adults bring with them. Um, you know, here we have the immigrants are entering uh, Ellis Island, a very American image of immigration, but they bring stuff with them, right? And now after, you know, initially the first generation may have dismissed the value of what they took from the old country. Now increasingly we, we really have almost sentimentalized the stuff that they take from the old country, but somewhere in between is a world where that knowledge, that culture, was meaningful to the next generation and needed to be passed on. So Howard Gardner's group at Harvard tells us that most teenagers do not have an adult mentor in terms of their online lives. Now, an adult they can turn to for advice about the complexities of negotiating this new world that we're all finding ourselves in. And so I think that calling adults digital immigrants allows adults to get off the hook, not to hold themselves accountable for helping guide young people. I don't believe they should be spying on young people, right? I don't want them snooping over young people's back, shoulders. I want them watching their backs, right? I want them engaged in a conversation that matters to them. But the most significant thing, I think, that I would say is that it's this language of the digital generation puts all of the emphasis on digital technology and ignores the way digital technology is connected to a range of other media. And so the term I'm only, I'm sort of half jokingly coined here of the transmedia generation sort of speaks to the reality that if young people are conducting their life in relationship to media, it's conducted across a range of different media platforms. We are consuming media across platforms in relationship to each other. That what I argued in convergence culture, we lived in a moment where every story, every image, every relationship spreads across every available media platform. And it spreads informally as well as formally. It's spread by decisions made in corporate boardrooms and by decisions made in teenagers' bedrooms. It's done so legally and illegally. But all of those decisions about what media is are shaped by a reality where we live across media, not constrained by a single medium. And I think that understanding that has consequences as we think about the political uses of new media in the ways that we're talking about it here. So a central thrust of the Spreadable Media book is going to be the distinction between circulation and distribution. So distribution is what existed in the world of mass media, of broadcast media. You know, it, the, the content is rolled out under a corporate schedule that makes a series of calculations to maximize profit. So, the Avengers opens in some parts of Europe before it opens in the United States. And there's a whole lot of complex corporate thinking that went into the decision about when to open that show, that, that film here versus when to open in America and what's the relationship of global to domestic market. And that's a decision of distribution. Circulation is this new hybrid system. Certainly we don't want to say those decisions of distributions don't matter. They still do. But increasingly decisions are being made by both individuals and networks of people 
to circulate content in unauthorized ways that actually starts to have a big impact on the cultural and political agendas of specific countries around the world. So if we think about CUNY 2012, this is not content that was com distributed in any traditional sense. They could, have, they could have taken all that money and bought airtime on American television and had nowhere near the global impact that they had in putting that stuff up on YouTube and circulating, right? That that's a set of choices they've made. But its circulation is based on lots of people deciding this content was important to them and spreading, moving it along. So that Hollywood would probably have a very good sense of how many million people were going to see it and in what time frame. The Invisible Children couldn't predict how many people would pick it up and move it from place to place. And that unpredictability is part of what led to the implosion of Invisible Children when this thing hit the way in which it did. Now I'm using this language unauthorized circulation because I'm trying to avoid the word piracy. Right? In the American discourse, the minute you say con circulation is unauthorized, the industry said you're stealing our content, you're pirating our content, this is bad, bad, bad. But piracy is a moral discourse that clouds our ability to ask some fundamental questions like who is benefiting from this act of circulation? So I doubt invisible children, even though they were hurt by the circulation of Cooney 2012, would see the circulation as an act of piracy. They gave free, they let loose of that content and allowed it to circulate. And they benefited from that visibility it gained. Susan Boyle's a more complex question, right? Because this is content produced for British television by the company Fremantle that someone took it off the air illegally, put it up through YouTube, and spread it around the world. For a period of time, they scrambled to figure out how do they make money off of that content as Susan Boyle's visibility is growing. At the end of that period, they released the album, and it becomes one of the top-selling albums in the United States and outsells Whitney Houston that year. So Susan Boyle, who probably would not have been known in the United States at all, unless the content had been pirated, ends up outsell outselling Whitney Houston because of unauthorized acts of circulation. So what we're trying to do in the book is to spend long enough the discussion of piracy to say what's actually going on, who's circulating what content to what effect and why, and to try to dig a little deeper into these acts of circulation. So the book grows out of the work we've done with the Convergence Culture Consortium at MIT. That was an organization we created after the release of Convergence Culture that brought together industry leaders and academics to talk about the future of the audience, to talk about the changes that were taking place. And we wrote, uh, I wrote with Chao Chang Li and Anna Dom, two of my, P my master's candidates, a white paper called If It Doesn't Spread, It's Dead out of which came the seeds of the idea for a book that Joshua Green and Sam Ford, both of whom were associated with that group, wrote with me. And then we invited many of the participants of the consortium to write short pieces, which is what circulates around the book. Now, we could, one way that the industry likes to talk about what we've just described is the term viral. Uh, and, and the language of going viral is the way both Invisible Children and Susan Boyle was explained by the American media. Now, I'm very uncomfortable with this metaphor of going viral. And the reasons for my discomfort will be clear if we read this quote from Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, which is one of the first places to articulate a notion of viral media. He wrote, we are all susceptible to the pull of viral ideas, like mass hysteria, or a tune that gets into your head that you keep on humming all day until you spread it to someone else, jokes, urban legends, crackpot religions, Marxism. That's his quote, not mine. Uh, no matter how smart we get, there is always this deep, irrational part that makes us potential host for self-replicating information. So if you look at it through the lens of cultural studies, which has spent 20, 30 years establishing the active agency of the audience in its relations to media, this all looks like we're losing ground really fast here, right? The audience is susceptible. It's hysterical. It's got something stuck in its head that it can't control. Uh, it's irrational. It's we're post for self-replicating information. Well, culture doesn't isn't self-replicating. Culture is human activity of making meaning of our experience. We create culture. We share culture. When Cooney 2012 moves through the world, it moves because someone saw it as valuable out of the, all the stuff that came through their inbox that day, chose that content to 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 pass, grab, and pass along. And they pass it along through a particular media channel. They pass it along through a particular social network. 
who was involved in a particular conversation, framed in a particular message, because they felt that it had a meaningful contribution to make of something they wanted to say. And we saw that the church groups and the student groups had different conversations, potentially going different messages they attached to that content. So the sense of it being involuntary activity doesn't explain very much about it. It allows the media industry to still feel like they're controlling what's happening with media at the moment they are profoundly losing control in a deep level. But inside the industry world, there's two ways of thinking about the viral. One is there are groups of people who charge large sums of money and promise to tell the secrets of going viral to their clients. The other are people who look and, and say, I don't know what happened, it just went viral. And so there's both occult knowledge and passive acceptance of the viral, but no real attempt to understand the social and cultural mechanisms which are shaping how circulation takes place at the present moment. So here's Susan Boyle, uh, sort of the example I used earlier. What we see is Susan Boyle starts to travel across the culture. She got picked up on a variety of blogs with very different subject matters. So here's a blog about karaoke, and she gets thrown out of a karaoke bar because the owner said she's no longer an amateur singer because she's been on national television. Here we see this thing gets picked up by broadcast news. Here we see, um, this is a science blog that's trying to talk about Susan Boyle's vocal cords. Here we see a church blog. She, it's a prayer praying for Susan Boyle because she's a church lady and very religious. Here we see a mommy blog that talks about how she takes care of her aging mother and, and sort of the relations of mothers and daughters. And here's a fashion blog about how Susan <laughs> Boyle is being refashioned for television. So all of them are having conversations around Susan Boyle as this content starts to circulate, but these, they're having very different kinds of conversations on very different axes to try to make sense of what's going on. As I said, at the time, the industry was totally caught off guard, and as a result, uh, you couldn't legally watch the Susan Boyle, the series Britain's Got Talent that Susan Boyle was about on on American television. It wasn't available on cable, it wasn't available on Hulu or YouTube iTunes or any legal channel, you had to go to this site or some other BitTorrent site, these are all pirate sites, or so-called pirate sites, to even watch the series. But here is the billboard chart when her record comes out and she has enormous success. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about the rest of the talk is how this translates into political language and political practices at the current moment. So if we imagine a politics of circulation, imagine what happens when grassroots groups networks, organizations begin to take advantage of these skills for political purposes. And this is somewhat what I predict in the very end of convergence culture, where I sort of say, we've learned through play skills that we're going to apply to more serious concerns. And I, for example, talked about spoiling survivor, uh, the sort of people who were digging out all the secrets of American reality television and what would happen if this was applied to the war in Iraq. And lo and behold, we got WikiLinks. Right, which is pretty much spoiling government records, sending information back into circulation, and so forth. So the, last fall I was in New York City, and I went to the side of Occupy Wall Street. And as I arrived there, just as I'm arriving, a bus pulls up and a whole, about 100 zombies came pouring off the bus. And they'd been attending a, re, a horror fan convention in New York, and they showed up at, at the protest site, still dressed in monster makeup, carrying signs, that were theme appropriate, right? And it turns out that we're discovering that the zombie has become an important metaphor for thinking about the government's decision to bail, bail out the banks and other companies. Uh, the idea is that these are undead corporations who should have died but were kept alive from the lifeblood and brains of the 99% of us who pay taxes in the United States. So it is a metaphor for understanding the governmental relationships that attaches itself to popular culture and participatory culture. That particular day, if I continued deeper into the park, I would have seen people dressed up like characters from Game of Thrones and uh, who were wearing signs that talked about the Lannister 1% or the winter is coming. There were people from Occupy Sesame Street that talked about 99% of the, the one, uh, one, 99% of the cookies go to 1% of the monsters. Uh, there were people wearing Guy Fawkes masks that represented V for Vendetta. All of these are images that became associated with the Occupy movement at one time or another. So it's speaking through the language of popular culture, but not through a single set of metaphors or references, 
Rather, it's choosing every available reference point to attach itself to in hopes that some pieces of it will circulate. Because Occupy is, at the end of the day, less of organized movement and more a provocation that sought to change discourses, to change the way we thought and talked about wealth inequality in the United States. And part of its politics was getting that message out through any and every available media channel, mostly social media based, mostly grassroots media channels. Now here's an example of how that can become effective. This is Pepper Spray Cop. He was a U University of California Davis uh, campus policeman who, who pepper sprayed a set of peaceful protesters sitting on the grass. This is the sort of thing that could have been covered by a local newspaper, but it probably wouldn't have gone national if it was not for the fact that people began to remix that imagery and mash it up with a variety of other iconic images, famous paintings, scenes from movies, political photographs, and threw it into circulation. And by Monday, it's happened on Saturday, by Monday, news media were counting 200, 300 examples of mashed up versions of Pepper Spray Cop, who became an icon of the, the Occupy movement, not by grassroots circulation again. No one saw all 300 of them, but all of them could spread through different networks and be seen by different groups of people, and that affected how that message flew, flew spread out from Occupy. We sort of see it as part of that. This is a chart that we've developed around spreadable media showing the evolution of the lolcat, right? So the idea of, of viral is that the same content keeps getting spread and recirculated. In fact, it's very generative process. New things get attached to it, new images emerge, so we go from lol cats to lol bears to lol walruses to lol theorists, and there's my lol theorist, you know, oh hey, I as in your media is explaining the lol, which is uh, what's happening at the, this moment. <laughs> so, and the idea, so as we think of this stuff spreading, we have to assume it's a resource we use to talk to each other. This is an advertising executive developed this slide based on one of my talks on spreadable media. And he says, if I tell my Facebook friends about your brand, it's not because I like your brand, but rather because I like my friends. So when I talk about Occupy, it's not just I'm connected to Occupy, it's that there's something about what Occupy is doing that is good conversation fodder, good resources for me to use in whatever exchange I'm taking place. And so to travel from place to place, it attaches itself to a range of images and topics which can be circulated through a variety of different networks and allowing for conversations to take place. And Invisible Children similarly uses attention-grabbing imagery, controversial imagery, to put itself into circulation. Now this channel of circulation is really central to the way we use media at the present time. So when I wrote about participatory culture six years ago and mostly talked about cultural production, people said, well, not, most people aren't writing fan fiction, most people aren't modding games, most people aren't making YouTube videos, but it turns out most people are making decisions to pass along content. And probably many of us have relatives who only, the only use of the internet is to forward things to other people, right? That passing along has got to be the most basic level activity of the internet. Turns out that CNN tells us the global internet user, whatever that is, just receives 26 stories per week via social media and shares about 13 stories per week online. The rest of this is US data, 92% said they got their news from multiple media platforms. 52% saw both online and offline sources. 72% said they follow the news because they enjoy talking about what's happening. 69% keep up with the news as a social or civic obligation. 50% rely on people around them to tell them the news they need to know. 75% get news forwarded through email. 52% share links with others around news. 51% get news. I mean, these numbers are from multiple surveys, which is why they don't quite add up. But what they do is a series of snapshots of the degree to which we are reliant for our news on forwards, links, exchanges of information with other social users. That is our social media hub becomes the central way by which we make sense of the world. And this is probably going to be true for the for future. If this is true for news, think how much more true it is for music videos, for comedy sketches, for segments of the family guy, for any number of other things people choose to pass along as content. We know where your children are, right? You, you know, you're, you're, you're attentive to their well-being. You don't want anyone else messing with your children, doing things to your children, so forth. And as long as we think of our intellectual property as our brain children, 
we are going to be deeply protective of how it gets used and how it travels through the culture. It says flip it though and think of yourself as a dandelion. The dandelion produces all of these seed pods and the wind takes them and blows them everywhere, right? And maybe you've done like this girl does and take a dandelion and blow on it. And th the dandelion spreads and some of them die, right? Some of those seeds land on the concrete and they get run over by cars and tracked in the mud and nothing good happens to them. But many of them land in the grass and start to grow to the point that we don't need to worry about the future survival of the dandelion, right? I predict when end times come and the world is ending, the cockroach and the dandelion will share the planet together. Right? These are the two least endangered species on the planet because the dandelion is so effective at transmitting. So what Doctorow, who's a science fiction writer, says is that most authors, suf authors suffer not from piracy but from obscurity, and the goal of many of us today ought to be to get our ideas into circulation, to send stuff out into the world. Here's Doctorow himself gives away his content for free online and um, encourages people to remix it. So here's another example of this politics of circulation. This takes place in the Middle East. This is a group of Palestinians. Uh, every week, the pa these Palestinians march through the occupied territory. They protest. They get stopped by the guards, at the, the Israeli guards. They get turned away, and they create video or blog post about it, and no one reads it beyond their own movement. This particular day, though, they dressed themselves up like the Navi from James Cameron's avatar. They painted themselves blue, and they marched through the occupied territory saying things like, sky people, you can't take our land. Right, they're shouting slogans from the movie, but slogans that are appropriate. They hijacked this Hollywood myth, attached it to the Palestinian cause, put it on YouTube, and the pictures got photographed and sent in newspapers around the world. The YouTube video got millions of hits. It became a mid-scale success in terms of spreadable content. And that's, that, I think, is a very different story. Now, we could say this means entertainment values become dominant over news values, that politics is giving way to entertainment. And that may be partially true. Or we can say this political group took advantage of the high visibility that Hollywood created around these images and attached their meanings to them and got greater circulation they would have before. And this group was savvy. It, it had a has a strong web presence, so if you follow the video back, as a certain percentage will do, they could drill deeper and get a deeper understanding of the political stakes of this organization. I'm going to skip some. All right. So this is Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm Gladwell enters into all of this by writing an article for The New Yorker in which he, said, he makes fun of the idea of Twitter revolutions. And his, you know, he, he makes a number of key points, but the most important one, I think, is that he thinks that people are, Twitter revolution don't require people to take real risk, that it requires a superficial attachment. And we could say that's that hack, that Slack division argument of people took CUNY 2012, just passed it along, they didn't take a deep commitment, and there's some truth to that. I think there are multiple problems with Gladwell's argument, which really took over the American media discourse about it. The first is, going back to what I said earlier about the digital, digital generation versus the transmedia revolution, it's, it isolates out Twitter as if it was an isolated technology, rather than part of the full range of media that we're involved with. So I don't think we live, we're seeing Twitter revolutions at all. I think Twitter plays a variety of t roles and variety of political movements at the moment but so do a variety of more traditional media forms. And if we look at the Arab Spring movements, for example, what we see is not Twitter dominating, but Twitter is one tool especially effective at getting messages out from the core group to the, lo the global population. And what Twitter is used with most effectively is cutting past government censors, cutting past mainstream media you know, gatekeepers, and getting messages out to other segments of the population. Well, we could, you know, if the, the parallel would be, he, he, he likes to talk about the civil rights movement in the 1960s. What we'd say about the civil rights movement is that it was a telephone revolution, in the sense that Martin Luther King, no doubt, picked up the telephone, called other black leaders around the South, freedom riders at northern universities, and come on down, we're going to have a protest in Selma, Alabama. Right, well, the telephone was not, was only one tool that King would have used in order to bring about that civil rights movement. It clearly played a role. But to reduce it to the telephone, it would trivialize the incredible amount of organizational work that went on. To reduce invisible children to just YouTube reduces the incredible amount of other traditional grassroots activities they've been involved with. 
to invest, to reduce the, you know, Occupy to Twitter is not to do justice to the, the amount of dedication of these people showing up day after day at various Occupy sites and, and participating in in-depth oral discussions of things and so forth. So it in fact distorts our understanding of these issues. I'm going to skip over some stuff. So that this brings us to a, another example that we've been paying some attention to, which is the Dream Activist. And this is a group that uh, Aureli Zimmerman and our team has been researching and really looking closely at. The DREAM Act would have been a piece of federal legislation that um, basically granted greater educational and citizenship rights to young Americans who either were born in the U.S. to undocumented people or mostly came undocumented after, after, after they were, while well, they were still quite young. Uh, so that they, they are themselves we're here without necessarily choosing to be in the U.S. They've grown up in the United States. They've gone to our schools and so forth, but the, you know, but they, they lack the documents needed in order to become citizens or even to get get to higher educational institutions, in a lot of ways. What Aureli's research is showing is that they've been incredibly effective at using new media to organize and rally behind their cause. That they're incredibly innovative in their use of new media platforms. This despite the fact that they often are the lowest of the low in terms of economic access to technology. That is, many of them don't have their own computers. They're using computers at libraries, schools, community centers. They're, they're, they don't necessarily have a lot of digital access, but they have a lot of digital savvy in which they're telling their story in powerful ways uh, through these other platforms. And partially they're doing it in face-to-face -face presentations. More of them are, and, and, but they're also doing it through YouTube. So one of the powerful tactics has been just pointing the camera at yourself and telling your coming out story, saying, I am, in this case, I'm Muhammad and I'm undocumented. Um, you know, the tell your own story, ex narrate your experiences, which is in fact contrary to Gladwell, not a low risk activity, but a high risk activity because publicly com proclaiming that you're undocumented in the American context can and does result in people being deported, right? That they, you can be thrown out of the country your life can be destroyed by, by taking this, this action. But the feeling has been that many Americans don't know anyone who's undocumented, or they don't know the people they know who are undocumented. That the sense these stories haven't been told, they haven't been personalized. It's something in the abstract that Americans are dealing with. And so the last year or two, Time Magazine reports that this week, the last year or two, there's been this big move to come out as undocumented. And it's had a big impact on the Obama administration. And some of you may have seen the news that Obama has, by executive order, changed immigration policy in the United States to provide more protection and more educational rights and opportunities to these young Americans, the so-called dreamers. These are some of the blog stuff that they've created. They're creating very powerful imagery. Increasingly, as it looked like the DREAM Act was not going to pass uh, in the federal level, it's moved to state levels. And one of the consequences of having a networked movement was they've been able to continue to fight state by state, pool knowledge quickly, compare notes easily across borders as it fragments to a series of localized campaigns. They can provide informational support to each other. The immigrant rights movement in the U.S. have historically been very much ethnic driven. So that even the Peruvians and the Mexicans or the Colombians don't necessarily work in common, leave aside the full range of other immigrant groups involved in this debate, uh, South, uh, the South Vietnamese, the Iranians, uh, so forth, who are involved in America illegally for one reason or another and are struggling for their rights. So this, but this movement has connected those groups together in very powerful ways at the younger generation. As they become more militant, they've done things like attach webcams to themselves and go into immigration headquarters and declare themselves undocumented and transmit what happens to them as long as they can, a kind of act of civil disobedience that feels very much like what took place during the civil rights era. And they're reporting protest and using the YouTube effectively to spread their message all over. Costanza Chalk describes this as transmedia mobilization, that is they're mobilizing across every available media channels. And interestingly, one of the, lang one of the metaphors that crops up often enough is that of the superhero. So we're seeing in their own material, they often use analogies to superheroes to talk about what it is to be undocumented. Uh, the, the metaphor of the X-Men and the X-School is one that we've heard used a lot. Of Spider-Man coming out as, and identifying himself publicly is another one that they talk about. 
But maybe the most pervasive one so far has been Superman, right? So something really interesting has been happening around Superman. Superman, in a, in a parallel universe story, an alternate universe story, in one of the DC comics, Superman announced he was renouncing his American citizenship and going to become a citizen of the world. And the American right went berserk, right? The conservatives thought, here you've taken this American icon who fights for truth, justice in the American way, and you perverted him into a symbol of, of European socialism, would be the way they would describe it, I think, in the current language in the US. Uh, and that anger was really directed at it. Well, this group, the Dreamers, turned it around and said, when did Superman ever become an, an, a, an American citizen? Right? If ever there was an undocumented alien in the United States, it's Kal-El of Krypton. Right? Here's a guy slipped over the border in the middle of the night. Right? He wasn't here illegally, didn't have a green card, didn't have a visa. You know, arrived in the middle of the night, he gets picked up by an Anglo family who try teach him to hide his actual identity, to live a second life, a fake identity. He even gets to become a reporter for a major metropolitan newspaper. But underneath it all, he knows that he's, he's not from this world, and yet he makes enormous contributions to American culture. And so the dream activists have begun using that language, that metaphor, to describe their experience. And it's been very effective, I think, for getting getting the message out. Here's another group we've been studying, involved in a similar process of hijacking popular culture imagery to create content and messages that circulates effectively across borders. This is the Harry Potter Alliance. The Harry Potter Alliance um, is a group now about 100,000 young people, maybe a little more, and about 62 chapters around mostly the United States who are involved in human rights activism in the name of Harry Potter. Right. Now, this may seem a little surprising until you recognize several things. First of all, J.K. Rowling was part of Amnesty International before she stepped out and wrote the Harry Potter books, a part of the story that's not talked about very much, but in fact her own political stakes. And she would be open about the fact that there are human rights themes about prisoners and minority groups and so forth running through the books. Uh, the, or Andrew Slack, the community, trained community organizer who started the Harry Potter Alliance, says that this is a story about an evil time. The government is covering it up. The new concentrated media is refusing to report the truth to the citizens. And the school becomes increasingly repressive in order to silence student voices. But young people nevertheless organize Dumbledore's army, an activist group, and go out and change the world. And so what he says to this generation of kids who grew up reading by reading Harry Potter and grew up writing by writing Harry Potter fanfic is, we're now ready to change the world. So what do we want to change about it? How do we work together? And he taps the mechanisms of fandom. He uses wizard rock, the form of fan music that's been very effective at using uh, digital dis distribution. He used, taps the blogs, he taps the podcast, and gets the message out and participates in a series of campaigns around a number of different issues. So here, Harry Potter and the Prisoners of Waldemort is about labor organizing at Walmart, the American department chain. Uh, he's, he, in, in Maine and in California, they get involved with debates about gay marriage. And they have house competitions to determine how many people each house uh, can mobilize to get voted, register to vote, and get them to the poll. So Harry Potter fandom has been organized around Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin as houses. And I'm a very loyal member of Ravenclaw, um, if anyone's wondering. But each of those houses are motivated to, 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 to try to get points for their house and something like a real world version of the point system in the books. You know, some of the activities are designed about overcoming your own fears and anxiety. And there's a kind of therapeutic dimension of confronting things like body image or suicide or depression and providing a support network, whereas others are concerned with politics of the environment, of human rights, of global disasters. He calls this cultural acupuncture. And the idea is, and quite unlike cultural Culture jamming, which was a metaphor of the 90s, where people tried to block the flow of broadcast media, his idea is to attach himself to, attach the organization to public issues, public debates that are taking place. So he says, every time that there was a new Harry Potter book or a Harry Potter movie, the, the news media wanted to cover any and everything tied to Harry Potter. They had to have more and more Harry Potter content to write about. So if he could attach Harry Potter to Darfur, you would get to the point where more and more people, the news media would cover you and you would get attention. 
Well, now they're at a moment where the visibility of Harry Potter is starting to decline. He's now created a, a second group called Imagine Better, which is reaching out to a variety of other fan organizations and trying to create a cross-fan community that's concerned in mobilizing around public issues. Uh, I'm going to skip over. I'm, I'm losing my place here. So, all right, so, I'm, so one of the things that happened is the first campaign he worked with was The Hunger Games. And The Hunger Games as a movie was going to open, as I said, it turned out at that point to have been the highest grossing movie in the United States for that year. Uh, and the result, and so they did a campaign for Oxfam around Hunger is Not a Game. And it gained a lot of visibility. The New York Times wrote about it, sort of cultural acupuncture at work, and was able to generate a lot of buzz. But then this Lionsgate Studio, which produced the Hunger Games movie, really felt threatened by the amount of visibility they were building and did what the intellectual property police around the world do when this happens. They sent out a cease and desist letter and said, you've got to stop your campaign right now. This is, you're violating our intellectual property. And the organization thought about it for a few hours, pulled, pulled its leadership, its rank and file, said, what are we going to do? And they said, we're going to call out the cease and desist letter. So they wrote, they got several major highly visible political bloggers. They sent them the story, said, here's hunger, on the eve of Hunger Games opening, Lionsgate is trying to shut down an effort to raise hunger awareness and raise money for, for people who are starving around the world. And it got picked up very, very fast. They went to change.org and started some online petitions. And that was generating real attention. And less than 24 hours later, Lionsgate picks up the telephone and calls Andrew personally the day the film is opening and says, uh, sorry about that cease and desist letter. That was a mistake. We really want to work with you. So this gives us some sense of the muscle that these fan organizations potentially explore, can tap in a world of spreadable media. That is, media, the ability to circulate ideas on a gra through grassroots networks is beginning to generate enough visibility that it can affect the decision making of commercial media producers who would traditionally have used distribution. They're changing the way people see issues, they're creating ways that people mobilize around issues, and they're doing so as one tactic of among many in the sort of transmedia campaigns that surround youth and politics in the United States today. So I'm going to end my formal remarks there and just sort of open that up for discussion, but hope that that provokes some thoughts and dialogue about maybe what's taking place here. The, the special issue of transformative works and culture you can find online includes a lot of international examples, but not, as far as I can recall, one from Eastern Europe. So I'm very curious as I talk to you if maybe you know stuff here that's doing works in similar ways. But this is, I think, the beginning of something that could be quite significant in terms of the language we use in politics, the tactics we use in politics. And it's proving to be very effective at getting young people who do not normally see themselves as political more engaged in the political process. So on that I will end. So are there questions out there? I'm happy to entertain thoughts, comments, questions, sneers, jeers, and cheers. Yeah, I think the scale in which this could operate is, especially as it starts to travel across national borders, is really, we've barely tapped the potential. So the question may be why we're not there, and you know, we're not already there. And I think it's because we've learned over the last five or six years how to use these social media in ways that are 
effective. But I think the potential scale is much greater than anything we've seen so far. And given that there are other interests in the web, on the web, like corporate interests, commercial interests, political interests, certainly certain corporations and what we would call entrepreneurs, um, the Facebook, for example, um, we're seeing how money can be made and how quickly these can scale up. And so it seems like we've only scratched the surface here. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we should be attentive to what's going on. I mean, I, Johai Binkler in his book, The Wealth of Networks, makes the point that, you know, that we tend to talk about this as commercial producers and amateurs, and there are all these other layers in between of nonprofit, activists, governmental, educational, religious content producers who already start with built-in networks that can potentially spread content. I mean, if you go back to the chart I showed of sort of so-called viral video, in the US, it's a strange mixture of commercially produced content, nonprofit produced content, and amateur produced content that exists side by side in circulation. Any piece of which, any of which could move to a greater scale and speed than we've seen before. Now, yes, and the scaling up of commercial or entrepreneurial issues give interest gives us a sense of what's possible. What we have to do, though, as we think about that, is keep in mind an important distinction between participatory culture and Web 2.0, which are not the same. You know, participatory culture for me, I often, people assume I'm talking about Web 2.0 when I talk about participatory culture, but for me, participatory culture describes several hundred years of struggle of everyday people to get access to the means of cultural production and circulation, right? It's not tied to a specific media platform or specific moment. It is growing right now. It's having greater impact and visibility now than ever before, but as a long history we could trace back through amateur publications and amateur radio and so forth that built to this. Web 2.0 is a business model, right, that seeks to court and capitalize on the energies of these people who are desiring to participate. So if you read the business language, Web 2.0 makes it sound as if the interests of producers and consumers are absolutely aligned. There's a seamless, frictionless connection between the two of them if you read Tim O'Reilly. On the other hand, I think what we've seen is that every Web 2.0 portal has been the site of major struggle over terms of participation, over data surveillance and privacy issues, over copyright and censorship issues, over the portability of our data from one platform to the other, over what kinds of brands are going to be on that platform. There's, in fact, ongoing struggles between this emergent participatory network of activities I talked about here and corporate attempts to control, regulate, and clamp down on it. So we're, for us to achieve its full potential, we've got to continue to work hard against both government regulations and against corporate uh, co corruption of the participatory culture. We, we need the tools they provide. We have to weigh the trade-offs that those tools bring with them, and we have to push as networks to fight back against those platforms to ensure that people have real democratic use of this technology. And so, so yes, I think, there's, I think there's real potential. I think there's also a struggle ahead of us to hold on to that potential and achieve that full potential. So I'm often described as a utopian, and I am to some degree, but as optimistic as I am, we don't get there unless we fight for it. And what these groups are demonstrating is they're willing to fight for it. The dream activists are willing to put their, their, their lives on the line for what they believe in. And they're taking a stand that's principled and risky. And I think critiques of that by Gladwell and others don't own up to the very real risk people in this generation are doing to hold on to the opportunity for digital participation. Yes, there's a hand down here. Good afternoon. I'm Wojtek Brinczka, and I would like to ask you, especially about the first part, about Tony campaign. Uh, because yesterday I came back from South Africa where I spent six months and there I understood because it came and uh, I, I, I saw it on Facebook when I was in South Africa and I understood that there is a huge gap between reality in Africa and how it was presented in this campaign and um, I would I like to ask you uh, do you think that the participation, digital participation, not the uh, activist participation like on the streets, but the just on Facebook, because 
the most people are sharing these ideas on Facebook without really understanding uh, the problems which are discussed there. Um, do you think that the participation are getting us closer or further to understand, uh, for example, this is an African problem because every 26 seconds some woman is raped in South Africa, even without war, even without conning, even uh, it's a great place for doing a business, for mining companies, big corporations, you know, who would probably like to fund also some uh, researches about participation of Facebook because they are really interested in that, like, uh, to present their goods, to present their products. Uh, but I, I remember, I remember when I was a child and I saw a video of uh, young uh, people in South Africa suffering from famine. And I remember that I understood, okay, there is some problem in South in Africa in general. And, uh, but I'm not sure about the solution. But when I see coin campaign on Facebook, I uh, get the impression that there is some simple solution. Uh, we can harass Kony and it will be all solved and I can participate on that. But the problem will not be solved. Women will be raped more and more even without Kony. And you know, uh, and this, this was the first part of the question, if you can Okay, well, let me... I'm also interested in uh, what does it mean to media research, you know, to in general, not just in this case. Yeah, I think, I think there's, a lot, there's a lot we can say about CUNY 2012, and I barely scratched the surface here. So please understand that I'm celebrating the potential it shows about networked communication. I'm not necessarily celebrating this particular organization or its, or its message. Uh, I think one, one thing I would say, I mean, there are a number of things to say about that. Well, the first would be that what CUNY 2012 should be understood of is not the la final word, but a provocation. And it has to, what the incident has to be read in relation to everything that came out. So the fact that the public res responded quickly, critically, the fact that many experts in Africa wrote editorials responding to CUNY 12 and complicating America's understanding of Africa, the fact that so many Ugandan voices used YouTube to respond to CUNY 12 and that those videos were seen by significant numbers of people in the US also have to be understood as part of a shift of the discursive context by which Africa's talking about. In some ways, the fact that this was criticized as harshly as it is demonstrates the potential of the digital to bring about a different kind of conversation than a broadcast-based video that talked about these issues. So I don't defend in any way the simple-mindedness of the message or some of the distortions that ended up being in the video. I think, though, that the, the critique actually helped change the way people thought about Africa, and I think that's really important. Now, one of the criticisms we've had of the Invisible Children is that they didn't prepare their, their supporters for that critique, right? They were an advocacy group, but they didn't prepare people to rebut things. Some of the critiques of CUNY 2012 were legitimate, some of them were not. Some things that people believe they know about invisible children are not accurate, right? But the, because the group couldn't mobilize in response quickly enough, because most of the rank and file didn't have the information they need, because they didn't really develop critical skills for thinking about it, then I think there are consequences for how that debate played itself out that all of these other groups are pulling back and trying to understand what's going on. I think some of the pushback reflects the traditional establishment of dealing with foreign policy, not wanting participation. Sort of people sort of saying, oh, you're wrong, our policy solution is better than your policy solution. And I think that's also something that has to be factored in as we think about it. That in some ways, this was about elites holding on to the ability to frame foreign policy over participatory networks, having a different perspective on what needed to take place. But so I think there's a, this is a much more complex story than the ones we've seen, I think it's going to be something we should be researching over a long period of time. Because what it revealed about the capacity of activist groups to use the net is enormously important. And we ignore it at our own, own risk. What it reveals about needing what we need to do to be ready to have that level of discussion also is really important and we need to be paying attention to. So in the spreadable book, we sort of coupled the term spreadable, that is the ability to circulate far, wide, and quick, we're drillable, the ability to have information you can drill down into 
and get more information. And we, our group has sort of argued that invisible children achieved spreadability with CUNY 2012, but didn't have any drillability at all, or really didn't look beneath the surface to allow people to ask questions, to get more information, to discuss deeper. That if they had said, we want to generate, instead of saying we want to force this particular policy, if they said we want to call this attention, issue to the public's attention, and we want people to discuss and debate what should be done about it, that would have been a better response, I think, to the context they found themselves in. And we might well be moving toward a deeper understanding of the kinds of issues that you're asking about, which are incredibly important issues for us to be dealing with. Yes, I think, it, I, think, I think it overall, I mean, again, it's generationally specific, it's maybe regionally specific, but the amount of writing about Africa in American newspapers demonstrably increased, and the amount of discussion of African issues demonstrably increased during this period of time, and invisible children were only one voice that was being heard in that, and other voices were mobilized off invisible children that deepened the discussion fairly quickly. So while I would not say it was the best way it could have happened, it was an effective way of generating deeper understandings of what takes place in Africa. Although there's still a huge gap in information flow from Africa to the United States, and I think we're, we're not to the point where US perspectives and African perspectives are equally complex or deep in understanding these problems. But I think there are plenty of examples where African voices that had not been heard by American media were being covered in the wake of CUNY 2012 that changed the, the understanding of those issues for the better, not simply for the worse. Okay, any other questions people want? Uh, so, just thinking Sure. All right, so there were two, I, I, I was sort of playing a little fast and loose with data there. So there were two sets of, num sets of studies that were included on that slide. The first one globally comes from CNN and presumably reflects markets that CNN is in, although they haven't been, they haven't disclosed all the information there. The second one, the second sets of numbers all come from works of the, uh, the Pew Center for Internet in American Life, which is a quite recognized social research center in the US. And they come from multiple surveys, which is why you know, I don't have a lot of footnotes there to, to describe the, the different methods of collection. But they represent snapshots, is, which is what I'm asking us to read it as. I'm, I don't think I put a lot of weight on any particular number there, but I think as a picture, they show us a particular pattern of media use that are worth, worth paying attention to. No, I'm quite sure it's not the central European market. And so the question is what's happening here? And part, that's part of what we need to understand. But forwarding of content in America and Western Europe seems to be a very dominant set of activities that people are involved with. And, that, and I'm arguing that that's a significant form of participation that will have some real impact on the future. But I just, got a, I just arrived here yesterday, so I'm not gonna pretend to offer insights into the Czech Republic-specific situation. Now, many Americans would, you know. We arrive and immediately tell you what to do. But that's not, not the way I tend to think about these things. And so I'm here to learn uh, and share my impressions of what's taking place in the US context and to learn what I can from people here about what you think is taking place in Central Europe and what the consequences of this will be for Central Europe, which I think is an important conversation that should be had. All right, should we, I don't know what we're doing on time, but should we, is there, I'm not seeing. Okay, well, if there's one more question out there, I'm happy to take it. There's someone down there. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I have to say, I would much rather serve under Picard than Kirk. Uh, I love classic truck. I grew up on classic truck. It changed my life. But William Shatner is a jerk, always will be a jerk. And <laughs> Kirk carries too much of Shatner's personality. And I discovered with the new, new track, the new movie, that I thought for years it was just William Shatner I didn't like, but I discovered it's actually Kirk I don't like, too. <laughs> so um, I much prefer Spock to Kirk. And, but Picard, someone who sits down, mobilizes the expertise of the people around them, actually follows the rules of civil discourse between planetary cultures as much as he can, and respects local cultures when he arrives there, more or less, as much as any American actually succeeds in doing. And um, the result is I definitely, if I had to pick an enterprise to be on board, it would be the next generation enterprise for sure. Okay, on that, I guess we will uh, move into the next part of the program. But thank you very much for listening.